this week's Torah portion opens up on the third day after Avram's circumcision. And we know that the third day is the day that the pain is the strongest. So the story is that God came to Avraham to visit, to visit Avraham, to visit the sick, and to uh, inquire on his health. Uh, the Talmud says something very interesting. The Talmud says that God made the sun extra hot on that day because God knew that Avraham loved having guests so much that even if he was sick, he would go out and try to find people to come over to his house. So in order to protect Avraham, in order that he shouldn't be troubled with guests, with travelers, God made it extra hot on that day so that people shouldn't be out. And the very first verse of the Torah portion says the following. Now the Lord appeared to him in the plains of Mamre, and he was sitting at the entrance of the tent when the day was hot. So the day was hot is a reference to what the Talmud says, that God made it very hot that day in order to make it easier for Avram. But nevertheless, Avram was sitting at his tent because he was waiting and he was looking to see, is there anyone who's going to pass by who needs a place to stay, needs a place to take shelter? So why did, why did God come to see Avraham? So you could see it in, uh, we could see it in the Rashi, very short commentary. I'll just read it because it's one sentence and it says like this. And the, and the Lord appeared to him to visit the sick. Said Rabbi Chama, the son of Hanina, it was the third day from his circumcision and the Holy One, blessed be he, came and inquired about his health, about his welfare, excuse me. So this, of course, teaches us something very important about, about um, visiting the sick. Visiting the sick is so important that Avraham came and did it, did it by himself. I'm sorry. God came. God himself came, appeared to Avram to check on his welfare to see how he was doing. But what did God do? You would think God has the power to heal. So perhaps when God would come to visit Avram, what would he do? Perhaps he would make him better. But that's not what God did. Like Rashi said, God only inquired about his welfare. So what was the purpose of that? What was the point of that? So first of all, this teaches us what visiting the sick is all about. It doesn't need to, all we need to do is be there for the other person. All we need to do is inquire, show that we care, give some comfort. So this in itself, even without any healing, this in itself allow, gives the person um, gives the person energy and makes them feel good already, even if there is no cure yet. In fact, the Talmud says something very interesting. The Talmud says that when you go visit a person, you remove from them 1 60th of their illness. So just by, by visiting a person, even if there's no cure, you're not bringing them any medicine, you're just coming and being there for them, says the Talmud, that removes from them 1 60th of their illness. So you see how powerful it could be, the impact you could make by being with someone, how much it means to a person that they know someone's there with them, someone's caring for them, someone came to, to, you know, to check up on them. The Talmud says another statement. The Talmud says that someone who visits the sick and prays for their recovery, it's considered as if they have given the sick person life. So look how important visiting the sick is. And this is something that God teaches us by he himself going to visit Avram, but God doesn't do anything special. He doesn't cure him. He doesn't, he doesn't do anything miraculous for Avram. He just inquires about his health, just inquires about his welfare. And this teaches us what we could do, the impact we could make, the difference that we could make in somebody's life, somebody who's not well, just by going or just by zooming in on Zoom or video 
or calling in, that makes a tremendous difference to, to, the, way, to the way they feel. And this will ultimately have an impact on their healing as well. Now, this is, of course, very important, the mitzvah of visiting the sick. But how important is it? How important is it? God himself came to, God himself came to visit Avram, to visit the sick. Now, you'll think, how great is it that, Av that Avram merited to have a visit from God? It's so, so, such a, a, a great thing to have God himself visit you. So that seems like maybe the greatest thing. But guess what happened? Just while God was with Avram, Avram noticed that there were three people in the distance. Guests, travelers, potential guests. So Avram wanted to see if they need some help, if they need a place to stay. So could you imagine God is visiting with Avram and Avram sees three travelers. So he tells God to wait. Let me see if they need some help. Could you imagine? So Avram, Avram understood the greatness of having a visit from God. But together with that, Avram understood somehow that having guests and, take, and caring for people is even more important. And this is, what the, this is what the verse says. The verse says like this, And he lifted his eyes and saw, and behold, three men were standing beside him. And he saw and he ran towards them from the entrance of the tent. And he prostrated himself to the ground. And he said, My lords, if only I have found favor in your eyes, please do not pass on from beside your servant. That's what the verse says. And the commentary Rashi says, This is to teach us that taking in guests is greater than receiving God, because basically what happened was God was visiting with Avram. It was the day that he was in, in tremendous pain from the Brit Milah, from the circumcision. In the middle of Avram speaking and, and meeting and, and being visited by God, he sees some travelers and he, he tells God, you, why don't you wait on the side because I'm going to take care of guests. So we see from here, says the Rashi, that taking care of guests and taking care of others, giving people what they need, shelter, uh, looking after them, is even more important than receiving God and having a visit with God. So this is very powerful, all about visiting the sick. And this really shows um, the, the kindness of Avram. When, when God is visiting you, that's something, that's a special moment for you. When God is with you, when God is with you, this is an opportunity to hang out with God, so to speak. But instead of Avram, uh, you know, enjoying that and spending time with God, because he saw other people, he saw guests who, who might need a place to stay, might need to have a bite to eat. So he put them first. He put them ahead of himself and ahead of God. Because Avram's, Avram's kindness was so, was, so, um, was so unbelievable that he, put, that he put everything ahead of himself. And he even put the guest before God, demonstrating that having guests and caring for people is even more great than having a visit with God. Okay, so that's the beginning of the Torah portion. That is about the visit of God to Avram on the third day of his Brit Milah. Let's continue with uh, the, next, the next part of the story is uh, not, not a very uh, happy story, but it's, this, it's the story of the city of Sodom. And Sodom is a city that was, was filled with wicked people and uh, filled with corruption. God decided to destroy the city of Sodom, and uh, we could see it in we could see it in the verse. Um, this is towards the beginning of the Torah portion, chapter eighteen, verse twenty. I'll just read it in English, just one verse, and it says like this: 
on Pasuk. It says, because the cry of the victims of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. So God was saying, I will destroy the city of Sodom because of the, because of the cries of the victims. And because the, so because the sin of the people of Sodom is so great, I, 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 will, destroy, I will destroy the city. Now, what was so wicked about the people and what was so wicked about the city of Sodom? So in fact, there was a very uh, terrible law in the city of Sodom. And the law said that whoever gives bread, whoever feeds a pauper, a sick person, a, a, a poor person or a stranger, they shall be burned at the stake. That was the law. If you help a poor person, if you help a stranger, that is, that is a capital offense and they burn you at the stake. And the, the, uh, one of the commentaries uh, tells a, a story, story of the daughter of Lot. Lot was the nephew of Abraham. Um, and the daughter of Lot, her name was Plotit. She was married to one of the leading citizens of Sodom, of the city. One day she saw a poor person had nothing to eat, and she had mercy upon him. So every day when she went to the well to, to collect her water, she would bring some food with her and leave it and uh, give it to this poor person so that he could have something to eat. So the people of Sodom, they wondered, how is it, how is it that uh, this poor person is surviving? You know, nobody is supposed to be feeding him. So how is he surviving? How is he managing? And so through them, you know, paying attention and looking out for, looking out to, to understand this mystery, finally it became, it became known what the daughter of Lot was doing. And she was taken to be burned at the stake. And her cries rose to heaven, rose to God. And this is what the Pasuk says. This is what the verse says, that the, because of the cry of the victims of Sodom is great. God decided that enough is enough. It's time to destroy the city, get rid of these, of these wicked and sinful people. But this did not go unnoticed by Avram. Avram had unconditional love for his fellow person. Avram was the epitome of kindness. And when he found out from God about God's plan to destroy the city of Sodom, Avram challenged God. Avram challenged God and he said, and I, I'm quoting it in, in the verse, the Pasuk says like this, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? So Avram was challenging God. He was saying, you know, maybe there are righteous people there. How could, how could you just go ahead and kill everyone? So Avram was looking for ways to Avram was looking for ways to pray on their behalf and to challenge God and to ask God uh, not to destroy the city. Perhaps there are some people who are righteous. We shouldn't destroy everyone because what about those righteous people? And the, the, story, the story continues and the story goes that God agreed. God said, if there are 50, God, uh, Avram asked for 50 people. He said, what if there are 50 righteous people? Will you save the whole city? God said, yes. Uh, Avram knew that there were not 50 righteous people. So he said, what if there is 40? God, he said, yes, I'll spear the city if there are 40 righteous people. Then Avram continued, he said, what if there are 30, 20, 10? And, uh, you know, God, uh, Avram was just kept asking. But of course, there were no righteous people. And ultimately, Avram had nothing to say. But just the fact that Avram used such strong words to challenge God, he actually used harsh words to challenge God. This tells us something very powerful about, about who Avram was. Avram was a person who cared for everyone. He, had, he showed kindness to everyone. He showed love to everyone. And even if you know, the whole city was known as a wicked city, he was going to do whatever he could to, to spare them and to save them from being punished and from being destroyed. And the commentaries point out the difference between Avram's attitude 
and the attitude of Noah. Noah, who we had uh, in, with the story of the great flood just a couple of weeks ago in the Torah portion. And there's a tremendous difference between them. There's a, there's a big contrast between Avram's behavior and Noah's because Noah, we don't find anywhere that he prayed on behalf of his people. So he knew that God was planning to destroy the world. He knew that God was going to bring a flood and that nobody would survive. Only the people on the boat would survive and only the righteous people were allowed to get onto the boat. But nevertheless, we don't find that Noah prayed on behalf of the people. Now we do know that he had the opportunity and he had uh, 120 years to try to convince people and warn people that there was a flood coming and that they, they should be careful. They should change their ways, repent, Otherwise, otherwise, God would, in fact, bring the flood. So Noah did spend time warning people, but in the end, we don't know of anyone who actually changed their ways. So we don't know of anyone that Noah successfully inspired to change their ways and to become a better person. So, so two things. So number one, we, we find that Noah did not pray on anyone's behalf. And number two, he was also not successful with bringing anyone back to a good path, to bringing anyone to repent from their wicked ways and from their sinful ways. This was Noah. Avram, on the other hand, was quite different. Avram prayed on behalf of the people of Sodom. Even the people of Sodom who were so wicked, Avram prayed on their behalf. Um, and not only that, people knew and people sensed that Avram truly cared about them. And because they felt that way, they responded. And so it says in the Torah, uh, it says in the Psukim, in the verses, that when Avram left the city of Haran to, uh, together with his wife, Sarah, they were joined by the many lives and by the many people who they touched and who they inspired. And that means that there were many people, men, men and women, who now because of Avram believed in the God of Avram. So it was thanks to, it was thanks to Avram's care for people and for Avram's, you know, uh, uh, dedication to people, a true care for people that when he taught them and when he offered uh, to, to explain to them his point of view and when he, when he showed them the truth of God, they in fact responded. And Avram was able to turn around so many people from idol worship to serving God. So two, two differences between Avram and Noah. First of all, Avram prayed on behalf of the people, even though they were wicked. And number two, because Avram truly cared about, about his fellow people, because he, he truly cared that they should become better people, and they should be following the truth. People sense that. And that is how Avram was successful in winning over people and helping them realize that idol worship is in fact not true. And it is the God, the, the, the creator of the world who is, who is the true God and who should be, who should be followed. So this is, this, this is something that we learn from Avram's conversation with God. When Avram challenged God to spare the people of Sodom when he was praying on their behalf. So this is something, this is something very powerful. I'd like to point out a, a one interesting verse um, that, that we have during the conversation, in the midst of the conversation between Avram and God. And the verse says like this, Avram answered and said, behold, now I have commenced to speak to the Lord, although I am dust and ashes. So Avram was a very humble person. Look how he called himself dust and ashes. So, so Avram, as great as he was, he was a truly humble person. And the, the, the commentaries tell us that it was thanks to Avram's humility that the Jewish people received and merited to have an extra mitzvah. 
So as a reward for Avram's humility, the Jewish people received a special mitzvah, the mitzvah, uh, which is called the mitzvah of Para Aduma, which is the red cow. The, what is the mitzvah of the red cow about? It is a purification process for somebody who became spiritually impure. So there is a way for them to become spiritually pure once again through a, uh, through a service involving the ashes of the red cow. What's the connection? What's the connection between Avram being humble and the Jewish people receiving the mitzvah of the red cow? What's the connection? So the answer is that the mitzvah of the red cow uh, was a very selfless act. So the person who was providing the spiritual purification, they were doing a very selfless act and they would they were considered to be a very humble person. Why is that? Because the person who was the person who was doing the service, the Kohen, who was purifying the the person who needed a spiritual purification, that service and doing that mitzvah actually made the Kohen himself impure. So the ashes of the red cow had a double effect. If you were impure it made you pure but if you were if you were pure it made you impure so it had this opposite effect depending on who who was coming in contact with it so in a way it was like medicine if you give medicine to a sick person it makes them better if you give medicine to a healthy person it's bad for them you should only have medicine if you need it so this is exactly how the mitzvah of paraduma worked the mitzvah of the red cow the service it made the Kohen who, who, who gave the service, the Kohen who gave uh, uh, the, the purification, he himself became spiritually impure. That, that's, how it would, that's, how, that's how it worked. Um, and so this, this really shows uh, the, the, the humility and the selflessness of the Kohen. Kohen is willing to become impure only to save someone else, only to make it easier for someone else or to multiple people. And this is the connection between Avram being humble and the Jewish people receiving the special mitzvah. Because Avram, Avram was humble and because as a, as a reward for his humility, the Jewish people received a mitzvah which really expresses the, humil the humility and the selflessness of the Kohen, the person who, who, was, who was giving the purification. Okay, I would like to, uh, I'd like to finish off with, with one, more, one more story and one more lesson from the very end of the Torah portion. And this is the story of Akidat Yitzchak, the binding of Yitzchak. And basically what happened was Avram came, I'm sorry, God came to Avram and he said, uh, please take your son Yitzchak and bring him as a sacrifice to me. Take him to a place which I will show you. Take him to a mountain which I will show you, to Mount Moriah, Har Hamoria, and bring Yitzchak as a sacrifice on the Mizbeach, on the altar. And I'll just read for you one verse, which, which, uh, which includes this commandment and this request of God to Avram. And the Torah says like this, and he said, Please take your son, your only one, whom you love, Isaac, Yitzchak, and go away to the land of Moriah, and bring him up there for a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. And so this is this is the this is the commandment. This is the request that God that God asks of Avram. Now, if you notice, in, in uh, it says, "Please take your son." God says God says to Avram, "Please take your son." In the Hebrew, it says, "Kach na et bincha." Please take your son. What, since when does God give commandments uh, with the word please? You know, we have many commandments in the Torah and we don't usually find the word please 
in, in, the, in, the, in the introduction. Why is God saying please here? And so Rashi, again, the famous commentator, uh, gives us a very interesting and perhaps unusual uh, explanation. And what Rashi says like this, I'll read you the Rashi. It says, Kachna, quoting the words of the Torah, please take. Um, Rashi says, the commentary says, it's an expression of a request. God said to Avram, I beg, you, I beg of you, pass this test for me so that people will not say that the first ones, the first tests, had no substance. They were worth nothing. So, Basically, God was begging Avram because God was saying, please do this because Avram had many tests. Avram passed, successfully passed many tests. However, God was thinking and God was saying, please do this one. And God said that because if you don't pass this test, people are going to say that the first ones, the first tests that you passed, and your first accomplishments are, are, not, are not worth anything. That's the commentary. That's what Rashi says. Now, this is very unusual. This is a very strange commentary because, as we all know, Avram led a truly remarkable life. He was completely devoted to God and to teaching others about God. He sacrificed everything that he had for this for this purpose, for this goal. He sacrificed everything, including his very life. You know, there's a famous story when Avram was given the choice to give up his belief. Uh, in those days, everybody believed in, in, uh, in idol worship. Avram was the only one who believed in one God, the creator of the world. And so it came a point that the king Nimrod, he was about to throw him into the fire and he said, either give up your belief or we're going to throw you into the fire. And Avram was thrown into the fire. So he, was, he put his life on the line. A miracle happened and Avram was saved. But this was, this was a truly remarkable act of Avram. He, he was completely dedicated, completely devoted to God. He gave his whole life to to, uh, to searching for God and to finding God and to teaching others, of, teaching others about God. And he was even willing to risk his life for this belief. So how would anyone be able to suggest that Avram's previous accomplishments and Avram's previous tests were not worth anything? How, how could Rashi, how could God make such a suggestion? Please pass this test for me, because if you don't, people will think and people will say that your previous accomplishments, your previous tests had no value. How could anyone suggest this? How could anyone say that Avram's re remarkable life had no worth? And the answer is that many people sacrifice everything that they have for their beliefs. Some People even risk their lives for beliefs that they may have. So in Avram's case, people could argue that Avram sacrificed himself just like anyone else would. Avram sacrificed himself because this is his way of standing up to his beliefs. This is Avram's belief, and he's going to stand up for his belief. Not only that, by standing up for his belief, even though he's risking his life, this itself would create awareness of Avram's belief. So in a certain way, as difficult as it might be to understand, in a way, it makes sense for someone who has such a strong belief to, to do anything, including giving up their life, just to stand up for that belief. So we know uh, uh, we know people, people do that. Unfortunately, unfortunately, today, people do that to harm others. But sacrificing yourself for your belief is not unheard of. It's not, only, it's not something that only Avram could do. So number one, standing up for your belief. Number two, through standing up for your belief, 
you're creating more awareness, right? Of course, it's going to be in the news. Avram was real, willing to jump into the fire. People are going to read it and say, wow, what is this that Avram believed? So someone could argue that in Avram's case, he wasn't doing it. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't, uh, of course, it was a sacrifice, but perhaps a sacrifice which was, which was calculated and which made sense. And so this is why uh, you, uh, uh, someone might be able to argue that the previous tests of Avram uh, you know, had no true value because perhaps Avram was doing it for, the, for, these, for these reasons. Now this test, the binding of Isaac, God's request that God, that Avram bring Yitzchak, Isaac as a sacrifice, this was completely different. There, no one could say after, after such a test, nobody could say this is, this has no value. And Avram is only doing it for himself and for his own belief. This, this story is completely different. How so? Yitzchak, Isaac, was, was the person who would continue Avram's legacy, right? So Avram, Avram made, a huge, made a huge change in the world. He taught people about a one true God. But how would Avram ensure that this message and this belief continues to the next generation? How could he be sure that his legacy is going to continue? The key to that was his son. His son Yitzchak would continue Avram's legacy. So imagine God tells Avram, sacrifice your son. Sacrifice Yitzchak on the altar. For Avram to go ahead and do this, he's basically, uh, he basically ending, guaranteeing the end of his, leg of his legacy. Not only that, this act would be done in complete privacy. It was up on a mountain. Nobody was there. Even Avram's closest aides were not there. Nobody was there. Avram was alone with his son. So number one, he would be ending his legacy. There'd be no one to continue teaching Avram's beliefs. And number two, it would, this act wouldn't create any awareness because there'd be nobody, there would be nobody to, to witness this. It wouldn't, it wouldn't even make the news. There would be nothing would be achieved from, from, from Avram's standpoint. Nothing would be achieved to further, you know, to further uh, 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 reach people and help people recognize God. So it, on the contrary, it would only end Avram's Avram chances of leaving behind a beautiful legacy. And this is what God was saying. God was saying, if you don't listen, if, if you don't pass this test, people are going to say, people are going to say that the previous ones were not worth it, were, 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 had no worth. People are going to say that the previous tests uh, you were only doing uh, to further your agenda and to further your belief. And God was saying, if you overcome this challenge, if you, over, if, you, if you overcome this test, this will demonstrate that Avram is a true and complete uh, um, servant of God and that Avram is truly devoted and dedicated to God. In the end, as we all know, Avram did indeed pass the test. And because of that, Avram was blessed um, with tremendous blessings, including that his descendants become a very great nation. Okay, so that's the story of the Torah portion. Of course, there's a lesson for us here as well. And uh, one lesson might be that Avram was the first to demonstrate this type of complete devotion and, and complete dedication to God. But this is not only a story for Avram, it's recorded in the Torah. And this story and Avram empowers us today as well, so that we can do everything in our power to serve God and to make this world a better place. So Avram was the first one. Avram was the first one to show how someone could have such a, such a love for God, such a love for humanity, such a, so much kindness, and such a complete dedication to God and uh, such a 
uh, uh, dedication and devotion to, to making a positive change in the world, to helping people realize the truth. And this give, empowers us. This empowers us and inspires us to do everything that we could to serve God, to do something for God, to do a mitzvah for God, and to make positive change in this world, make this world a better place.